Hello, Jeff. Thanks for joining me. Now, you're currently overseeing the EMEA region for Genzyme, but can you start by telling me a bit about your background before that? Sure, Paul. I was originally trained as a physician in internal medicine and pediatrics, and uh, for a brief period had my own company before joining Genzyme, where I've been for the last eight years. And so within your current role, what disease areas are you particularly focused on right now? Well, Genzyme in Europe, Middle East, and Africa um, is working to bring uh, about 17 commercial products to those uh, 55 countries uh, or so. So it's a very diverse business today in this region, uh, bringing medicines to about 500 million people. Um, the disease areas are clustered into four main uh, groupings. Uh, obviously, the personalized genetic health area uh, focuses on rare diseases, um, mainly inherited diseases of enzyme deficiency in, in childhood and also uh, affecting adults. We have an area focused on renal and endocrine diseases, uh, mainly in the area of uh, chronic kidney disease, phosphate management, and in the management of patients with uh, thyroid cancer. We have a cluster of uh, products in the transplant and oncology field. And finally, a series of products in an area we call biosurgery, which is essentially the application of bioactive materials uh, into joint and other uh, interstitial spaces in the body. So it's a very diverse business today over a diverse geography. Okay. And some of those areas that you've just mentioned are, I guess, more rare diseases, more niche areas. If we just focus on those for a moment, what impact does that have on the development process? Well, I think working in the rare disease space has a number of unique features, and, and they really provide a, an unusual uh, level of connectivity uh, to the patient community and indeed to the uh, treating community um, in, in each of these areas. And, and the reason for that is, is twofold. One, because of the rarity, these are small numbers of patients. They have a tendency to know one another and to um, be so unusually uh, valuable and instructive in their individual disease manifestations. So it's, it's not uncommon to find that you learn something important about your drug from even the, the effect on a single patient or a small group of patients. And so that lends a certain intimacy to the development process that's very unusual in the biotech and pharma world. And it's, it's quite a privilege to, to interact with patients and families and uh, physicians in that way. I think the other thing around rare diseases is, um, in many cases, they are uh, relatively um, uncomplicated from a um, biochemical um, perspective. Uh, in the area of our personalized genetic health uh, business, uh, many of these diseases are monogenic diseases. There's a single gene uh, which is impaired or missing, which leads to a deficiency of an enzyme, and in that sense, there's a very direct relationship between the therapy and the disease itself. And for that reason, um, in the uh, development of these therapies, uh, you have a very strong understanding of the role of the therapy that you're giving. And therefore, it takes many of the uncertainties around development away. Now, of course, on the flip side comes uh, the, the balancing factors uh, that have to do with how difficult it is to find enough patients and to, cre make, to create a homogenous enough group to study. But on balance, I think working in the rare disease space is uh, an incredibly rewarding thing and uh, something that, that adds an element of personal connection that is, is very hard to find otherwise in this area. So just to pick up on your point there about the personal connection and the fact that you're very much closer to the patients in these areas, do you think there are some learnings there that could be translated to some of the larger therapeutic areas? I think so, um, probably on both sides. I, I think patients, uh, no matter what their disease, uh, have enormous amount uh, to be found in connecting with one another. Um, and I think in common diseases, uh, that ability or instinct to reach out to one another is, is perhaps less strong because it appears that you know it's a common disease and everybody should know everything about it. So I, I think on the one hand, there's probably a lot more that can come from sort of patient interaction even in large diseases, and you do see that in many large disease areas, um, but, but not all. Um, you know, I think on the uh, 
developer side or on the industry side, um, patients are an incredible source of inspiration, and I don't think they're any less inspiring for having a common disease. Um, the grace and the courage with which people deal with their diseases and interact with their therapies is, is really a remarkable thing, and I think the more close we can get as an industry to understanding their real needs and challenges, the better we can tailor our future therapies and current services um, to, to really providing value. And of course, this combination or equation between meeting true needs among patients and, and really delivering not just the therapy, but a whole range of services to patients, that's exactly what the health system and payers want. And so this interaction between uh, industry and patients within the right guidelines and frameworks can be a very productive way to get therapies to be more and more on target. Now, within the European region, obviously access can be an issue. What are some of the challenges that you see specifically when you're talking about some of the smaller patient populations in terms of ensuring they do have access to these newer therapies? Well, I think the most important thing is, is that the disease uh, state itself is well understood. In the case of rare diseases, uh, they have much um, lower profiles within the healthcare community, and often they have no profile within the payer community. So there's really a, a consistent effort that's needed to raise awareness and to help people understand the, the, the problems and challenges that patients who have these diseases are facing. And then uh, as a result of the rarity, uh, also generally the cost per patient for these therapies is quite high. And so if you combine a lack of awareness with a per patient price tag, which is uh, usually impressive compared with therapies for large diseases, that combination can lead payers to be very hesitant about providing the therapy uh, for patients. So I think the biggest challenge to providing access is in helping to demonstrate the need on the one hand and on the other hand, to make the impact of the therapy very clear. And I think as you get to that crossroads, then a, a very natural dialogue can occur where a partnership between industry and payers can be developed to make the sustainable access to therapies um, an, ongoing, uh, an ongoing phenomenon. And as you've highlighted there, the, the issue with, I guess, these more niche areas is you can end up with a very high cost per patient which doesn't sit necessarily very comfortably with some of the more extreme cost containment measures. And I'm talking about, for example, the UK's body NICE. So do you think some of these health technology appraisal processes or cost containment measures do need some adap adaptation for these rare diseases? It's a really good question, Paul. I, I think the um, any discussion along those lines has to start with the acknowledgement that rare disease patients have an equal right uh, to safe and effective medicines uh, as do patients suffering from common diseases. So I don't think there's any question that we need to lower the bar um, for, for bringing therapies to, to these disease areas. On the other hand, um, when you talk about comparative effectiveness or on health technology assessment, the goals, uh, which are to provide a high value therapy for a reasonable or sustainable cost or investment, uh, is unchanged, that, that that remains important. But the quantity and the qualitative type of data that's available at launch or at the time of HTA or comparative effectiveness assessment is almost necessarily less than it is for uh, large uh, therapies for large uh, diseases. And so uh, I think the timing and also the approach to those evaluations has to be scaled back somewhat at the early in the early time of approval and the emphasis has to then include the development of in-life outcomes data following approval so that payers can know how they make the decision at the time of approval and how they will then evaluate that decision, say, in 24 or 36 or 48 months after approval so that the delivery of value can be proven and sustained in the real world, recognizing that most HTA methodologies have really been built to deal with much, much larger data sets than are available for orphan diseases at the time of approval. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Now, I guess another challenge here is obviously the development costs for these drugs in some of the more rare disease areas are still fairly substantial. So do you think there's more that the healthcare systems or regulators could do to support the development of novel therapies in these areas? Yeah, you know, it's often been said that um, the development costs for rare diseases are not necessarily lower um, than they are on a per 
medicine basis for large diseases, and there are many reasons for that having to do with the uh, difficulty of identifying and bringing together patients um, quickly enough and in a geographically concentrated way to do the development. Um, but uh, even so, of course, the orphan drug legislation, which in the U.S. includes R&D tax credits and other mechanisms to help with development, um, has been very successful in, in bringing um, companies uh, and research labs to focus more on, on these areas. Um, Increasingly, in uh, Europe and other jurisdictions, the um, incentives have very, very little to do with development. And I think the uh, mechanisms for funding development are reasonably well developed in the pharma and the biotech um, space. I would say today the challenge is much more around creating a rational and timely market for therapies that have been approved. Because um, in the private sector, the ability to continue to invest and to maintain the pipeline of innovation for new therapies depends crucially on the success of existing and high-value therapies, meaning those that, that deliver high value to, to patients and to, to families and physicians and payers. So I think creating a ready and timely market is now much more important for the sustainability of innovation in the rare disease space than necessarily the early stage tax credits are. Okay. Now, I just want to move on to a different area with this next question, which is there's obviously a lot of excitement around some of the preventative medicine which is coming out. And I'm, I'm talking about things like some of the cancer vaccines which are being trialed at the moment. So when you look across your portfolio, which, of course, encompasses the oncology space, what areas of opportunity do you see within preventative medicine? I think preventive medicine and the concept of aiming for wellness and health as opposed to just a treatment for disease is an essential part of the equation of, of making our health care investments uh, sustainable and, and higher value over the long term. And I, I think for me, as I look across our portfolio in renal disease, genetic disease, cancer, the uniting theme um, among all of those is the ability to accurately and quickly diagnose patients while they're in a state of health or near health. And um, whether you're treating chronic kidney disease and, and difficulties with phosphate management uh, or bringing a chemotherapy to bear in a, in a cancer uh, or treating a genetic disease, the faster a patient is diagnosed and the more quickly the appropriate therapy is selected and given, the better the outcome. And so, I, you know, the, the mechanisms for that are, of course, highly various depending on, on the disease state. In genetic disease, it means more use of newborn screening because if a genetic defect is, is available and detectable at birth, then the progress of disease can be monitored more quickly, ancillary therapy can be provided, and at a certain moment, disease-specific treatment can be initiated. And in every case, in our experience, when treatment is initiated earlier, patients uh, do better. Um, obviously, I think you're also pointing to the idea of, of a whole new wave of medicines, so therapeutic vaccines or indeed even gene therapy. Uh, these are therapies that can be given ahead of a disease state based on a risk profile. And if their effects are as long-lasting as they have the promise to be in practice, then they really will usher in a new era of, of healthcare. So I think the orientation to wellness and to health is a very strong driver for thinking of, of therapeutic approaches and um, approaches beyond therapy into diagnostics and public health and awareness that can really make a, a big difference over the longer term. Now, as a final question, I've got to ask you because it's very topical. Um, obviously, the recent news about the acquisition of Genzyme by Sanofi Aventis, do you think that will have a significant impact on the way you're operating within the EMEA region? Well, we're obviously uh, very early in the process of understanding uh, how we are going to be working as part of the uh, Sanofi Aventis family, but I can tell you that uh, the joint goals of, of the companies are very strongly aligned around uh, really working to make a meaningful difference in the lives of patients and you know, this ability to do so on an even more broad uh, global basis and to do so taking the best of both organizations is, is really quite exciting. So I don't expect that um, the areas of focus where we're, where we're working today will change. I do expect that our capabilities and our ability to leverage what we do on a more global basis and to perhaps do so more quickly 
uh, will change, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that occurs over the coming months and years. We'll see how that pans out. So, Jeff, thanks very much for your time, and thank you very much for your insights. Paul, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the time.